Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Episode 87, John Michael Greer on Pre-Psychological Modern Astrology and Pluto. In this episode, JMG returns to the show, and uh, we get to nerd out on astrology. Uh, we get to especially talk about this pre-psychological modern astrology, which is sometimes th- thrown under the bus these days. People either talk about like ancient astrology or psychological modern astrology. So it's a, it's a really interesting period, and it aligns with a lot of the occult stuff going on in... Uh, in the U.S. and in England during that time, like the Golden Dawn and the Rosicrucian stuff, um, you know, Max Heindahl and uh, C.Z. Zane and all those folks doing their their stuff. So we get to talk about all that and his book, um, The Twilight of Pluto. So that's this is a fun show. And uh, in regards to astrology, I am offering horary readings uh, for a pretty inexpensive. Uh, deal just 25 bucks a question so hit me up at info at plantcunning.com with a burning question and I will delineate a chart for you okay let's get to the interview well welcome back to the show John Michael Greer how are you doing today I'm doing very well, thank you. The heat has broken. It's turning into the kind of pleasant late summer day here in East Providence that I like. And yeah, I'm oh, good. thank goodness for that. It's been real hot this summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you've you've joined us on the show before, um, and we're excited to talk with you today, mostly about astrology and about mm-hmm. um, your new book, The Twilight of Pluto. So. Yeah. I'd like to ask you first just how you got into astrology and when you started first diving deep into the subject of astrology. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, that's, that's a little bit of a complex situation. When I originally got into occultism in my teens, and, and, and I, I looked at astrology because, of course, it was an important part of the occult traditions. Everything referred to it somewhere or other. And I looked at it and said, wow, this seems complex. And then um, a little later, I was by the mid twenties. There, I was really getting very serious in my occult studies, and I gave astrology a hard look and said, "Okay, this is very complicated. There is a lot to it. Right now, I'm plunging head over heels into golden dawn kabbalistic magic, which is enough to keep anybody busy for a decade or two. Um, I'm going to wait and do astrology when I turn middle aged." So um, time passed. Let's see, it would have been about, getting over 10 years ago now, um, I looked at myself in the mirror and saw the gray hairs coming out and all the other usual signs that, okay, I'm <laughs> middle-aged now, I should probably take a look at astrology. And so I, I did the usual thing. I got various books and paid attention to this and that variety of astrology. I found a, a variety that I appreciated. I worked with Renaissance astrology for a while. This was when I was starting, when I was working on translating the Picatrix with, with Chris Warnock. And then ended up gravitating toward a different system that I that I now practice. And I just kind of went from there. So it's been about 10 years now that I've been doing serious astrological work. Um, of course, you know, I, I, had the, I had the basics down. You can't get a, a, a basic occult education without knowing the signs, the planets, the aspects, all the usual stuff. And at least looking at your own natal chart. But yeah, it's been about 10 years that I've been doing serious work. Yeah, and, and that's a really uh, crucial point, too, that like you were, you've been, you translated and helped translate some of the uh, classics of medieval astrological magic. And Mm -hmm. like those have become very, very important to a lot of practitioners now. Um, But you, you ended up going into a, in a different route because like maybe 50 years ago, a lot of these translations weren't pop like they weren't around like you couldn't get the mm-hmm. tricks you couldn't oh, get no. if, like, you wanted, if you wanted the pick tricks um 50 years ago you either needed to know latin or arabic or there was a german translation there was a decent german translation so those were your choices and even then trying to find a copy was a nightmare mm-hmm. this was before the age of the internet when actually when chasing down um esoteric documents was a pain in the rump 
Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and now there are all sorts of other translations too. Like uh, Benjamin Dykes has been putting putting together uh, he, a bunch. He, you does, know. he does great work. He does really great work. It's not the kind of astrology that I like to work with, but but I, I honor the man for for the effort he's put into getting these these great trans, these great texts translated. So, do you think you could tell us a little bit about the astrology that you do practice and why mm-hmm. you chose that? Okay. What what happened was I started um, paying attention because I do a lot of work in early 20th century American occultism. There's a, there's a whole world of occult teachings there. Many of them referred to astrology. Many of them included astrology. The, many of the occult schools in those days included astrology as a matter of course. And so I discovered that there was a whole world of astrology that nobody was paying attention to. These days, in astrological circles, it's either modern, post Dan Rudyard, um, psychological astrology, or it's Renaissance and before. And in between, there's this great gap. Well, there isn't a gap. There was a, there are actually a lot of really interesting, really creative astrologers active in the 19th and early 20th centuries. You're talking Alan Leo. You're talking Llewellyn George. Um, you're talking um, Ivy Goldstein Jacobson, who's a major influence on me. Um, Max Heindel. There are many others, and they they all have some things in common. First of all, it's not the modern. Astrolog- or the modern psychological astrology, the kind of thing that focuses on who you are. Talk, why don't we talk about me for a while, is kind of the attitude. Um, they're into prediction. They're into prediction, they're into medical astrology, they're into actually finding out things, figuring out what's going to happen, um, understanding what is happening outside of the, the narrow confines of the, of the individual personality. Um, they are all compatible with, um, most of them were actually occultists, and those that weren't were very compatible with occult practice. And they'll include um, information on Uranus and Neptune. One of the things that I found rather um, rather off-putting in the long term working with Renaissance astrology, brilliant though it is, useful though it is, Uranus and Neptune are planets. They also have effects. I was noticing um, as I started to pay attention to my transits, you know, when the moon, when the moon was in an aspect with Uranus or an aspect with Neptune, I felt it. And yeah. so I wanted something that would include the, the the more recently discovered planets. And of course, you know, the, the traditionalists don't use those because that's not part of the traditional lore. I understand that. I get that it works within a system. I wanted to make use of it. So that kind of that kind of led me to gravitate onto these this sort of um, late nineteenth, early twentieth century astrology. Go on. Well, yeah, that's that's a kind of a big issue because I mean, well, you know, running around in some traditional astrological circles, sometimes you'll hear people say like anybody who uses Neptune and Uranus and Pluto are just don't even understand astrology. And I was like, well, that's a little <laughs> fundamentalist there. I think. Well, you know, they they don't understand their astrology, and I get that, but. The, one of the things that I use as a touchstone for my own astrological practice is how well does it work? Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, when when these two planets are in aspect, does that make an effect on my life? Because I, we'll, we'll get into that later. But I track my transits very closely, and I also make use of progress charts and things like that. So I'm constantly making predictions. And if I find that some particular approach makes accurate predictions, I'm going to go. Okay, I want to do that. Paying attention to Neptune, paying attention to Uranus, those two give me the wherewithal for really valid predictions. And so I'm not going to I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to pretend those don't exist and ignore the information they give. No, why? Yeah, again, I understand if you are a traditionalist, if maintaining and developing and reviving the tradition is your thing, that makes perfect sense. You're not going to be dragging in additional planets. You're not going to be dragging in anything else. But if you're primarily looking for effective modes of prediction, why would you ignore one? So. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I've also seen people say, like, you know, using Arabic parts or using these other things uh, will often make y- using Uranus or Neptune irrelevant for them. So, mm-hmm. but. But I, I, it seems as though there's a lot of different ways to do something, and it might I mean, depend on the individual too. Like, so for mm-hmm. instance, like Robert Hand, like he's done the the psychological astrology, modern astrology, um, mm-hmm. and then he has gravitated towards using like whole sign houses and mm-hmm. not using the modern rulerships. And he says that for him, yeah. the modern rulerships don't work. So, do you think mm-hmm. that like actually 
maybe one system works better for a particular person and one system works better for another? I think probably so. And my guess is you can find the reason by looking at the chart, by looking at their natal charts. Mm. Ah. I've noticed something very specific. We'll be, we'll be talking more about Pluto later on, but one of the things that I've noticed in my research into Pluto, now that it's been downgraded from planet status, those people who have Pluto very strongly placed in their chart, Pluto still makes a difference for them. Yeah. Those people who don't, I'm one of them. My, my Pluto is just kind of sitting out in the, in the boondocks, uh, twiddling mm-hmm. its thumbs. And Pluto, I, the, the the reason that I started having some questions about Pluto's planetary status is that I went through a series of major transits across my natal Pluto, and all the officials, to all the books were saying, your life will blow up totally, and the transits went by and nothing happened. Mm. <laughs> so I was going, okay, maybe. So, so for me, at least, in my predictions, in my work, Pluto doesn't rate. And it may, be, it may well be that for someone who does not have Uranus and Neptune in powerful positions, or who has, say, Saturn in a very strong place, since Saturn is the planet of tradition, um, they'd be better off not using these things. Right. But um, for those of us who have strongly played, I have a very strongly placed Neptune, um, and I have a relatively strong, I have, a, I have an angular Uranus, um, and those, you know, those are significant in my chart. They play significant factors, and so I can't ignore their presence. There they are, you know, big as life and twice as ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so then that gets us into the point of, uh, into the topic of like rulerships, and mm-hmm. uh, like there are all these they're, they're modern rulerships. And so, for instance, you'll use Uranus as the ruler of Aquarius instead mm-hmm. of Saturn. Um, That's correct. Has, has that? How has that worked for you? And like, do, do you use both of them as like co-rulers? Or no. just just Uranus. No, I I use I use I use Uranus as the ruler of Aquarius, and I use Neptune as the ruler of Pisces. I have found that that enables me to make better predictions, mm-hmm. and this is especially true in my mundane work. Um, we you know the the sort of Aquarian energy has has a Uranian quality. It is not traditionalist. It is not stick in the mud. It is not Saturnine. If, as I believe, the age of Aquarius began at the, um, in, in late 1879, well, you know, we've seen the Aquarian energy now for getting on for a century and a half. And it's not a Saturnine thing at all. It is a malefic force, no question. Uranus is a malefic. Um, but it's a disruptive, revolutionary um, constant change and, and jolting about and innovation and destruction. Very, very Uranian. So would you use like, so it, it, for instance, if you want to do like a, an, an astrological talisman, would you, okay. would you make like if a, name, yeah, yeah. You, the problem is we are in a posi- we're in an awkward position right now because Uranus and Neptune have only been known for a few centuries now. Right. And astrological magic has not yet caught up with that. The magical systems that we have don't make room for, um, Uranus and Neptune. And, and in fact, the way they're set up, um, if, if you know that, if, if you know how, say, magic squares, for example, are structured, um, they go from the Earth, which has a magic square of 10 by 10, the Moon is 9 by 9, and so on up to Saturn, which is 3 by 3. Well, you can't make one. You cannot make a magic square that's 2 by 2. Right. Mathematically, it's impossible. And a magic square that's one by one would just fit the number one. And that's not, that, that actually does tell you something about Neptune. But it's not actually going to be helpful for magical purposes. You can't trace a, you know, a sigil on it. There's just the one thing there. So yeah. the magical systems we have now are not well suited to including Uranus and Neptune. Um, there, is, I, there are, I think, some shifts going on now that will eventually, maybe centuries from now, produce such a thing. I've noticed a lot of people are beginning to use a numerological system very different from the old one that makes the sun as one, moon as two, mercury as three, and so on out to Neptune as nine. And now that makes life a little difficult for the sun and moon because you can't make magic squares that way. But, you know, other things will doubtless be evolved. Symbols are evolving and so on. So I think, you know, down the road, there will be room for that. But for the moment, if I'm doing an astrological talisman, I use the methods that work. And those are the methods that only work with the seven planets. We don't know how to make Uranian and Neptunian talismans yet. Right. Um, But a Saturn in Aquarius talisman does work. Oh, yes. It was, you can do Saturn in you, you can do a Saturn talisman in 
Um, well, I wouldn't want to do it in. Well, it's retrograde right time. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wouldn't want to do it now, but I also wouldn't want to do it any of the signs of, of Saturn's detriment and fall. But I have, my, my suspicion has been that you can do Saturn in any sign where it's not actually afflicted if you get it well dignified otherwise. Get mm. it angular and with, and with good planets and actually get, get some interesting effects. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, then there are also the minor dignities like face and term. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Put we get in face term triplicity or what have you. You've got a lot of options. Yeah. Um, and, but so how do all of these how do all of these work? Like you, you can make a Saturn talisman in a, in, a, in Aquarius, but yet yeah. for you, Uranus works better as the ruler of Aquarius. Then you me, have... We we are in we are in a we're in a, a state of transition, and since nobody knows why astrology works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Nobody knows. We I try getting the grant money to find out. Nobody mm. knows why it works. We don't know the underlying mechanism. All we can do is take traditional lore and then experiment with it. Um, as, you know, if if I am correct, and Saturn will you you can do a talisman of any planet in any sign where it's not actually afflicted, so long as the planet is dignified, then it would make perfect sense that a Saturn in Aquarius talisman would work because it's not afflicted in Aquarius. Yeah, and since your talisman, your normal talisman um, rule is to have the planet fortified in as many ways as possible. You have it angular. You have the moon applying to it by a benefic aspect. You have other planets, you know, benefically placed. You can get them. All of that's going to going to make for a good talisman, whether or not the the actual sign rulership is there. Yeah, now, the thing that, the thing that's good, that's going to be interesting, and again, I won't live to see this. This is centuries down the road. They're going to figure out, um, okay, do Uranus and Neptune have terms? Uh-huh. Do they have triplicities? <laughs> do they have deckhands? Oh, boy. <laughs> right, yeah, that's... that's, what and that's going to cause That's going to cause several centuries of confusion before it finally gets sorted out. And we'll see. So um, what we've been talking about for the last 10 minutes, though, has been a little complicated. So some of our yes. listeners might be a little out of their depth. Um, okay. And <laughs> just to go back, like, to getting into astrology, and it's such a wide oh, wow. field, like, how do you have any advice for how to actually start to, to get an access point yeah. into it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a book, the, the, the best introductory book for the sort of relatively traditional, um, not, not capital T traditional, but the pre-psychological modern astrology. Um, Derek and Julia Parker have a book called Parker's Astrology. It's heavily illustrated. It's um, it doesn't go deep, but it's not meant to. It's a it's a beginning textbook. And my suggestion, if you want to, to if one of our listeners wants to understand astrology, pick up a copy of that book and get your own birth chart. And they just start going through your birth chart and look up the position of each planet and the position where your houses are, how the signs relate and so on, and how they all relate together. The, the classic way to learn astrology back in the day was to start with your own natal chart since you know yourself better than you know anyone else. So you can study your natal chart and understand a lot of astrology that way. Um, beyond that, it starts getting complicated. Um, fortunately, all of Alan Leo's books are in the public domain at this point. You can get them from archive.org, free for the download. You can get them various other places. Um, Llewellyn George, who was really the, the my go-to person there, his book, The A to Z Horoscope Maker and um, Delineator, the original version of that has been out of print for a long time. Llewellyn Publications, which owned the copyright, brought out the new A to Z um, horoscope ma- maker and delineator, which is very modernized and very psychologized, and which I don't like much. You know, <laughs> your, mile- your mileage may vary, but I don't like it. I like the older one. Um, getting the older one is a little difficult these days, and I may talk to a publisher about that if they want to um, risk potential hassles with, with Llewellyn. But, um, but Llewellyn George, is, uh, all of his writings are long out of copyright, and they should be available. Um, if you can find the books by Ivy Goldstein Jacobson, mm. um, she, she, was active, she was mid-20th century. She was. She lived in Los Angeles, which at the time was the great occult hub of North America. Um, she used to type her own books and take them down to a print shop to be printed and bound off her own typescripts. Nice. Um, and she was just. She was an an odd, but 
very, very capable astrologer. Her book, Simplified Horary Astrology, was the book that taught me how to do horary readings that actually work. Mm. Okay. And she, she wrote about a dozen books on astrology. They are some of the best things that have ever been written on the subject. They're, they're brilliant. Mm. Um, and, but they're very hard to get. They can be hard to come by these days. I'm hoping one of these days the publisher will realize what, what they are, track down the rights, and bring those puppies out. <laughs> yeah. Preferably not just in the typescript, you know, like lay them out, make them look nice. Um, there are others. You know, there, there, there were quite a few very capable, Robert DeLuce is another good example, very capable, very competent astrologers who were producing first-rate work. And because it wasn't the same stuff that um, Dane Rudyard was doing, that, oh, I'm going to lose his name, um, Jones, the guy, who, the guy who worked out the Sabian symbols and so on. Oh, yeah. When I don't need it. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, there was this little clutch of astrologers in in the middle years of the 20th century who correlated astrology with psychology, which is great. But the problem was that in the in the the astrology boom of the 1960s, people came to the conclusion that's all there was to astrology. Um, you know, talking about yourself, talking about your personality. You know, who cares about predictions? We're going to talk about choice-centered astrology where you can have whatever you want. It didn't work well, but it sold like hotcakes. Is that when and, all the horoscopes got really popular in like every newspaper and magazine? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was oh, that was the work of a couple of good marketing agents. Um, oh, Sidney Omar was heavily involved in making that happen, and oh, I'm forgetting his name now, but he did the um, Encyclopedia of Ancient and Forbidden Knowledge, which is a hilariously bad book. Um, <laughs> Zolar, Zolar was the name he went by. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they, they just they turned out these these newspaper hor- newspaper horoscopes, which are which are crap, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the thing that I have to tell everybody, I, I had to I had to explain that to somebody on my 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 most recent um, open you know ask me anything open post online. Um, your which sign your son is in tells you diddly squat. You actually have to look at your horoscope. Right. Yeah, might, might tell you how your vital energy is uh, <laughs> focused or something. Yeah, right? it will. You really? Well, it'll tell you. Yeah, it'll tell you a little bit. But uh, what about the, what house is it in? What are its aspects? How does it relate to the rest of the horoscope? Without that, it's not going to tell you much. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, kind of another like beginner in, into astrology question is how did the ancient astrologers actually interpret the meanings of the planets and the moon and the sun? Like, what was that process like? Oh, it's, it's very simple. We, we have their notes. This is one of the amazing things. We've got their notes. This, the, the huge benefit of um, ancient Mesopotamia was that they wrote on clay tablets and then baked them into bricks. And there are, in the British Museum, in some other European museum, there are whole warehouses of these things written you know clay tablets covered with astrological writings what happened was that people got the idea um be about five six thousand years ago people got the idea that maybe these these amazing moving stars moving lights that were moving against the background of the stars that they were in some sense connected to events on earth they were gods or the messengers of the gods and wow what if we study them what if we track what they're doing and compare them to what happens on Earth? Okay. And so it was a it was an empirical science. Astrology is still an empirical science. It's not a matter of dogma. It's a matter of well, how did that work for you? And again, we've got their notes. We know that for literally thousands of years, priests and priestesses perched on top of these big mud brick pyramids, ziggurats as they were called, in Mesopotamia, up you know where where you, the blowing sand is much lower down, and there you are looking at the glorious clear night sky of the Middle Eastern desert, and um, okay, look, there's that little the red one, the one we call Nergal. Oh, he, how does that relate to, ooh, there's, let's see if there's going to be a war. The last three times this happened, there was a war. Guess what? There was a war. Mm-hmm. We call Nergal Mars these days. And so, yeah, the, the, they did it on the basis of, of experience, of tracking things in a very scientific fashion, okay? How did that work for you? 
And so that kind of actually political astrology, what's now called mundane astrology, was the oldest kind of astrology. Um, natal astrology only came along because people started, to, some of these people started saying, okay, well, I understand that a new crown prince has just been born. And what were the stars doing at the moment of his birth? Well, let's see, um, Nergal was here, and Shamash was there, and so on through the, you know, through the Babylonian names of the planets. And, wow, I'm, uh, okay, what happened? We have some other, horse, other you know, charts of what happened when princes were born. How does that work? Mm-hmm. And so with that, give it, give it 2,000, 3,000 years of hard work and, and detailed record keeping. And, okay, well, we've got a prince born. Okay, how to, oh, wow, yeah, okay, we've got Shamash here, we've got Nargal there, and so on and so forth. There's Ishtar. Okay, this guy, this one's going to be lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, and then all, after all of that immense body of detail had been gathered and synthesized and worked with by um, Sumerian, Babylonian, and Syrian astrologers, the Greeks came on the scene. The Greeks loved, us, loved geometry. And mm-hmm. the Greeks were the ones who looked at that and said, oh, we can construct a geometrical pattern called a horoscope. And look at these planets, these distances that you have. Those are angles. Those are geometrical angles, um, you know, seen with regard, you know, with regard to the Earth, and they're 120 degrees here, and so on. And the Babylonians are going, what? <laughs> 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 but the, but it took it, it took only a few centuries of of these crazy Greek geometry fiends to create something very like modern astrology. In fact, the the Hellenistic astrology that so many people are reviving right now was what happened when when you know Greek geometry hit Babylonian arithmetic. Mm-hmm. And and three thousand years of astrological records, and everyone went, "Whoa, this is cool," yep. <laughs> or however you say that in ancient Greek. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a lot of observation, trial and error, mm-hmm. writing things exactly, pattern records. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The same. The same way that any science works. So, do you consider astrology a science or an oh, art? Of course. A science. Um, well. It's a there as with everything. It's a science. It's a technology, and it's an art. Okay, in terms of the 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 basic structure, the things you have to know, the research project, and so on. It's a science, mm-hmm. and then the application to specific circumstances. That's where you start getting into art. Just as building a bridge. Okay, you're building a bridge. It's based on physics. There's a lot of science in there. A lot of mathematics. A lot of geometry. But the actual making of the bridge, the actual design. That's where the art comes in. I like that analogy. So it's, very, so it's very similar. It's very similar. Yeah. Although if you mention that around a, around a current scientist, they will have kittens on the spot. <laughs> uh, do it. It's it's very entertaining. Mm-hmm. Our kitten just uh, just walked in. As soon as you said kitten, we just got a kitten. <laughs> there was a kitten. Yeah, you see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, kitten. I hope you enjoy astrology. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's gonna he's gonna get into it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but well, that's that's really interest. I mean, it, interesting. Like, it it's it is both a science and a technology and and it all mm-hmm. and an art. Um, but that mm-hmm. brings me to a metaphor. I, I think that it was you who said this, but it's like the because like Hellenistic astrology works and like ancient mm-hmm. astrology, like um medieval astrology works and mm-hmm. Jewish you know uh, Vedic astrology works. Okay. Um, but Chinese Chinese astrology and Mayan astrology, they'll work. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that you you I think it was you you said that it's like uh painting. You know, you could use like um pastels or you could use oil mm-hmm. or you could use uh charcoal. Um exactly. You can make a good portrait using any of these things. You can make you can make a glorious picture using any of these any of these these art materials. Um, if you want to use the bridge metaphor, the, you know, if you build a bridge in the Roman style, you're going to have a bridge for a good long time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if you build a bridge, in, <laughs> and then our bridge, yeah, exactly. You know, that's that bridge is going to be there. If you build a bridge in the medieval style, it's going to work. They made de- they made quite decent bridges in the in the, in the, in the, you know, the 13th and 14th centuries. If you build it in the Victorian style or Renaissance style, or well, of course, the latest modern style, you better make sure you know get somebody to check your math because some of those fall down. But but right. <laughs> you know there were many different ways they, they they were making good bridges in India in ancient times too and if you take their methods and follow them you'll get a good bridge and so it's a matter of what kind of bridge you want and also what kind of bridge you know how to make yeah 
You know, they all they they all have to take into account the basic physics of how do you support, you know, a roadway going over a river. You know, how does how does the, the how does gravity work? How does the various pressures and so on? And so there, there are certain similarities, but beyond that, there's a lot of complexity that is part of the tradition. And since they work, why worry about it? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, another way of looking at astrology that I find useful is, is as, as a language, you know, it's a language mm-hmm. and like, you know, at, as you've pointed out before, you know, ultimately it's cavemen going, ooga booga, um, <laughs> at a cat or, and say, yeah. or you have a Frenchman saying, uh, I don't know how to say cat in French, but <laughs> you know, everyone has yeah. words for cat. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you basically, yeah. You basically, here we, here we have, here we have the cat walking in and the, and the English speaker says, well, it's a cat. And the French go, no, 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 um, it's un chat. And um, the, the, the Russian speaker goes, yep, kotchka, and so on. So you go through, but yeah, they're all talking about the same things using different words. Right. And so that's kind the of... Chinese speaker, the Chinese speaker is, is calling it a Mao. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, oddly enough, is also fairly close to the ancient Egyptian word for them. Huh. Meow. 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 <laughs> Mao. Mao. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the cats are actually trying to teach you how to how to speak their name in Egyptian. I like, wow. I like that. Wow. You know, it, I do like that. <laughs> it really gets into what they actually sound like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but but I see that with, with so many arguments about like house divisions mm-hmm. and as, even as you know all all the all these different things. There are, oh Lord, love a duck, yes. <laughs> and sometimes, like, well, it's hard to know what what like objectively works better. Or what works mm-hmm. for the individual, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, here, the house divisions is a good example. I know a lot of people use whole sign houses. Yeah. And they apparently get good results from them. Um, whole sign houses would make a hash of, out, of, out of the mundane astrology methods that I use because those, those depend on the capacities of houses to be different weights. So you can intercept the signs. You can have two signs in, or two, two houses, two house cusps in the same sign. That's, that's very meaningful. It's important in prediction. And so I typically use Placidus houses because, you know, they have those fe- it has those features and... Again, I get good results when I use them, but I understand that other people get good results from whole, from whole sign, you know, whatever works for them. And it might be also a matter of like using a different uh, system even, or how mm-hmm. or just house division for a different purpose. Like horary also works better from my perspective, using some sort of um, like either, either regimentat <laughs> regiment mm-hmm. or plastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I use I use Placidus for my horary readings also, and there again, having that flexibility in house cusps is very important for getting meaning out of it. Yeah. But again, there are people who do whole who do whole sign in and do accurate readings. That's true. And yeah. successfully predict the future. So what you know, whatever if it works for them, you know, ten ten thousand years from now we might be able to figure out why. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> put it down on put it in your reincarnation planner so that you ten thousand years from now you can get reborn and oh that's how it works. Okay. <laughs> so do, do you think we'll still be practicing astrology in ten thousand years? Um yes. Cool. There is every reason to think that astrology has been practiced in every society complex enough to notice the, the movements of the sky. Um, there are folk astrological traditions in many hunter gatherer peoples. Um Stonehenge is a, is an immense monument to astrology. Now, at that time, very clearly, the five planets were not known. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was it was solar lunar astrology. In fact, the oldest traces of astrology we've got it's in, in dribs and drabs here is solar and lunar. The planets right. came in later. They came in with civilization, and and you know, for all I know, they've been discovered and lost before in the distant past. We don't know that this is the first cycle of civilizations that has ever existed. Mm. That's that's true. That's also true, yeah. I wonder what 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 Atlantean uh, astrology looked like. Do you think they had Uranus and, and Neptune? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, if if I had if I had detailed past life memories from Atlantis, I might be able to tell you. As it is, and um, one doesn't have much in the way of any idea. You know, it's, who knows? You know, and <laughs> yeah, 
But if there was a literate urban civilization during the latter part of the last ice age, which is when the, Atlant- the, the kind of Atlantis period wa- will have fallen, and you know, um, I figure they probably had at least planet, you know, the this, this basic seven planet system. Right. And if they developed um, sufficiently um, good telescopes and, and um, mathematical systems to detect Uranus and, or Neptune and Uranus, they might have done it. Yeah, and that, that brings us to a, a, a important part of like of your book um, is like how the plants were discovered and like how they mm-hmm. how they relate to the history of of, of human civilization. Yeah, yeah, that was the thing that just it just dropped on me. I was looking into the because I was trying to figure out what how to make sense of the rise and fall of Pluto as an astrological factor. And I said, okay, well, I need to know about Uranus and Neptune. I found out about Sir- the time that Ceres spent as a notional planet of uh, Vulcan and some of these others. I said, okay, what about the big five? Right. What about Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn? And that was when it dropped on me like a ton of bricks. They were discovered at the time that urban, that urban civilization came into being. And what do they rule? They rule all the features that are part of urban civilization. You yeah. know, sun and moon will give you a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Yeah. And human yeah. beings can thrive that way, of course. We know that. But once you start getting the gardening and the fine crafts and arts and so on, that's Venus. You start getting... Um, established cities, that's Saturn. You start getting hierarchical systems in religion and politics, that's Jupiter. You get war, that's Mars. Also, livestock herding, which is Mars. And then eventually you get writing, which is Mercury, who's the, the hardest one of all the, cl- the classic five to notice. Ah, uh, yeah. Because he's, he's, he stays so close to the sun, it's not, it's not at all common that you can get a good view of him. So yeah. Um, and then, you know, when were they discovered? They were discovered when these things first came into being according to the archaeological records. So, you know, what we're seeing there is, is an echo of the first great age of human astrological discovery. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you figure that you figure that people, you know, people in, in Paleolithic times when, when, you know, um, flint arrowheads count as high tech, they noticed the sun, they noticed the moon. It's kind of hard to miss them. Um, the women will have noticed the moon very specifically because menstrual cycles are fairly closely uh, correlated with lunar cycles. So, you know, you pay attention to the moon for that reason. And if you track how many moons pass, you know, how many full moons you have, you know when the reindeer herds are coming back. And so, you know, they will have had good practical reasons, but, you know, the doubtless they had other reasons as well. Yeah, I mean... And uh, yeah, and doubtless they also told stories about the stars, about the constellations. Every yeah. every society I've ever heard of does that. So you have the basics, a uh, kind of basic astrology present, even in that profoundly ancient period. But go on, you were about to say something. Well, uh, well, even in like the the Norse society in in Sweden, and even in, up until I think the 19th century, there were uh, rural people who used the rune stuff, rune, rune state, mm-hmm. to mark mm-hmm. the, the the sun and the moon to know mm-hmm. when the the time for the festivals would be. You know, when do when do you go? Oh, yeah. to the festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ex- yeah. Exactly. And you have. Um, similarly, you have the a lot of the very the classic ancient calendars, whether it's the Colini calendar, which is the only surviving Druid calendar we've got, or some of the the calendars of the calendars in ancient Indian civilization, or the calendars of the Greeks, and so on. Yeah, they're, they're all they're, they're all keyed to the sun and moon. Right. Yeah. So then Pluto came onto the scene really quite recently in 1930 as, Mm -hmm. and then in 2006, it was uh, demoted from planet Mm -hmm. status, I guess you could say. So can you talk about what uh, the Plutonian era was like and what it represents? Sure. Okay, let's let's start let's start with the basic facts of the matter because a lot of people get confused about what happened. Um, what happened was that in by 1900 it was very clear that the, based on the numbers they had that there there should be another big planet off beyond Neptune because Uranus and Neptune their orbits weren't quite right based on the best estimates. They're, they were move a little slow here, a little fast there. Something's going on there. Must be the gravitational attraction of other planets. So the astronomers started searching. For it, of course, um, right around 1900, and um, what was then called 
Planet X. If you if you read a lot of bad old science fiction, or if you watched um, Japanese kaiju monster movies, um, Planet X is is kind of a term to conjure with even back then. But so, but that was Pluto for a long time, and and of course it was discovered in 1930. And there was a little problem with the discovery because they were looking for a planet roughly the size of Neptune based on the gravitational attraction. The little dot that they found out there, well, maybe it was the size of Earth. Too small to have enough gravity. Then they started using more and more techniques. Of course, astronomy became, got more and more technologically sophisticated. We had the first satellites. We finally had orbiting telescopes. We finally sent space probes out to Pluto. And every one of these things turned out Pluto got smaller and smaller, and smaller. There was, a, there was actually an article published, I think it was in 1980, in one of the, uh, astro, the astronomical magazines, the serious scientific magazine, jokingly suggesting if this continued, Pluto would vanish completely by, by 1984. You know, they kind of graphed the decline. I mean, there's <laughs> right. where the line ends up. Flip, it's gone. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the fact of the matter was that when we finally got a space probe out there, when the, what was it, the New Horizons probe circled the thing, it's tiny. It's like a seventh the size of our moon. It's one four hundredth the mass of the Earth. It's a little snowball out there. It is so small that its gravity is not enough, not strong enough to clear the space around it of floating junk. <laughs> and so when the so you know this guy, this built up and built up and built up and finally that's why in two thousand six the um, the International Astronomical Union sat down and said, "Come on, guys." We have to deal with the fact this is not a planet. People had also discovered a whole flurry of other little ice balls scattered up uh, out in, in what's called the Kuiper Belt, which is a, a belt of lumps of uh, ice orbiting way past the orbit of Neptune. And it became very clear that Pluto was just the closest in large member of the Kuiper Belt families. And so it was, they said, okay, well, we were wrong. It wasn't a planet after all. But at that point, inst- at that yeah. point, America was very attached to Pluto. We like yeah. culturally important. Yeah. People, oh, Pluto. Well, this, this, it was funny. I mean, as soon as Pluto was discovered, Pluto was adopted, especially by America. Um, I mean, Walt, that was when Walt Disney named Mickey's dog Pluto the pup. Mm-hmm. Um, Pluto was, you know, everyone liked Pluto. Um, Tom Corbett, space cadet, went to Pluto. Everybody did stuff on Pluto. Um, Pluto was a fascination as as it gradually shrank. Um, people tried to pretend that wasn't happening <laughs> because we loved our little ice ball out there on the edge of the solar system. Loved it. And so, yeah, yeah. When when the scientists said um, it really was, never was a planet at all, we were wrong. Sorry about that. People had kittens. <laughs> Another kitten. Uh, is the kitten showing up again? What? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, you know. But um, people had kittens. People were convinced that these evil scientists had aimed a death ray out there and vaporized, you know, Pluto. No, they just recognized that scientists make mistakes. And in this case, they made a whopper and they had they had to eat a certain amount of crow. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that makes it all even funnier is that by that time, they'd also figured out those discrepancies in the orbit of Uranus and Neptune didn't exist. We just had bad numbers in those days. Once we had satellites going around each of them, we figured it all out, and there was clearly not a big pl- another big planet out there after all. Wow. <laughs> so it was discovered as a result of a mistake. Yeah. And, um, so, so, yeah. No, the, the, the astrology, the astrology did not come off well with the, the Pluto affair because, uh, they, now, the thing is, astrologers had actually predicted the discovery of Pluto. Um, there were people who were saying um, in the 1920s there is something near the fixed star Wasat. The, you know, the, the traditional, uh, I don't remember exactly where Wasat was, but the, the traditional things say Wasat is a, you know, is a mildly important fixed star, but there's something important there, something that's, that's really messing with the horoscopes. I wonder what it is. Then Pluto was discovered about you know, a couple of degrees from Wasat. And everyone went, oh. Um, who was the astrologer? Isabel Hickey, another of the, the classic astrologers from back in the day. She predicted in the early 70s, I think it was, that Pluto had a very large moon, nearly as large as Pluto itself. 
And she named the moon Minerva and argued that you could, in some sense, choose whether you're going to be influenced by this Plutonian or by this Minervan energy. Um, it was, I think, six years later that we discovered Charon, the, the, the really big moon of Pluto. So the astrologers were on the ball in the discovery end of things, but the downgrading caught them on the hop. People did not expect it. There, had, there were all of these books about Pluto, your Pluto transits, doom is near at hand. People were, had gotten into quite an industry of freaking out over, over you know, Pluto affecting their natal chart. And then all of a sudden, Pluto wasn't a planet anymore. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of rhetoric, a lot of noise. And it's, it's really unfortunate because if you look at Pluto from a mundane standpoint, if you look at the influences that came into play when Pluto showed up, the influences that came in, that built during the period when Pluto was rising in importance and faded out afterwards, it's clearly that just as Ceres, which was a planet for 50 years before they downgraded to an asteroid, um, this was a, this was a temporary thing. This was a, an influence that appe- that rose and fell in the heavens, and that does happen. Yeah, and so what does Pluto represent? Um, well, there there are a couple of things you could say. Pluto, we all, we, I mean, the classic definition of Pluto is that Pluto is the underworld planet. Uh-huh. Pluto is a subversive planet. Pluto is the planet of uh, Pluto is a planet of stuff down below that disrupts everything. Um, in mundane terms, Pluto is the planet of nuclear energy. You know, the stuff down below, down in the subatomic realm, that disrupts everything, as they found out in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> um, Pluto is the planet of psychoanaly- psychoanalysis. Um, you know, here's the unconscious, that deep stuff where there are all these energies and you can release them. Um, Pluto is all about releasing deep energies. It's, it's the planet of the criminal underworld. It's the planet of communism. The idea that the proletarian will rise, the proletariat will rise up and overthrow things. It's that surging up from beneath yeah. quality. And that's what Pluto primarily represented in its rising phase. In its failing phase, it, without abandoning any of that, Pluto became the planet of overblown hype. And you can watch that by looking at every one of those things and how they turned into overblown hype. Um, nuclear power was going to revolutionize the world or kill us all, take your pick. It did neither one. Uh, psychoanalysis was supposed to be this revolutionary thing that would completely reshape society. At this point, Freud is, mostly, is generally considered a quack. And there are, there are reasons for that. Um, we all know how communism did. Right now, the, practically the only people who consider it worth thinking about are on American university campuses, um, and you know, they're used to they're used to spending time doing shoveling abstract daydreams. Um, and one can go on. Space travel is another great Plutonian thing. Space travel. Remember, we, we we were supposed to be zooming. By now, we were supposed to have cities on Mars. Didn't happen. Isn't going to happen. Overblown hype. <laughs> We were going to separate our, you know, blast off from the planet and separate ourselves from the world and go spinning out into the void. Very Plutonian. Plutonian. Didn't work. Very good reasons that it didn't work. Nobody realized at the time that deep space is saturated with hard radiation. Um, That's why we shut down our moon program in the early 1970s. That's why Russia decided to shut down theirs before they even really had one. Um, And so all of these Plutonian things rose looked like the wave of the future crested, turned into overblown hype and unfulfilled promises, and they're trickling out. One of the things that I found in my study is generally when a planet comes on, when a planet is newly discovered for about 30 years, well, Saturn cycled beforehand, you have the influence of the planet building up. And when a planet, when a, a non-planet is downgraded, like Ceres or like um, like Pluto or like Vulcan, which was believed by many astrolo- astronomers to be a planet before it was its existence was disproved in 1915, you have that 30-year tapering off period. And so our 30-year tapering off period finishes in 2036. Right. So, so it's we still, have it, another 14. We have 14 years. So it's still kind of in effect uh, on in your theory. Yeah, it's basic. It's a fading influence. Yeah. But you still, I mean, you still have people promoting, um, 
nuclear power. You still have people promoting space travel. You still are going through the motions. You still have people promoting communism and so on and so forth. You still have all of these. Th- there, there are still Freudian institu- institutes out there. You know, they're all of these. They're they're fade. They're fading, but they haven't quite finished failing yet. <laughs> um, if I'm right. They're going to go the way of well, you know, Ceres was the was the planet of the Romantic movement of political romanticism, artistic romanticism, that whole um, very complex, very lively, very influential cultural movement, um, which guttered and died in the thirty years after um, after about eighteen fifty, which was when when Ceres was downgraded, and at you know. <laughs> Most of the classics of romantic literature are hardly readable these days. You try reading The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe. It's hilarious. It's not intended to be hilarious, but it's hilariously funny. All these characters angsting to a degree that, that, that a, a modern drama queen would find over the top. And yet it was profoundly moving. People literally committed suicide out of sympathy for the main character. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, damn. And nowadays, nowadays people read it and they go, oh, "Come on, this is absurd," <laughs> you know. And in the same way, I figure that after twenty thirty six, people are going to read the literature of the age of Pluto. They're going to read Portnoy's Complaint if all copies haven't simply been pulped by then. They're going to read William Burroughs. They're going to read a lot of this stuff, and they're going to go, "What was the point of this?" What's the point of all this wallowing in in you know the grubbiest sorts of sex and drugs and all this? Yeah. Why? It's yeah. not even funny. Go on. The generation it, uh, that does kind of exemplify Pluto pretty well. That's another uh-huh. thing. in college. Everybody was into the beats and and I don't know. It just did not do anything for me. I don't, but I guess also mm-hmm. the band Nirvana that I, that also to me oh, is yeah. Pluto. So those oh, are yeah, gonna, they're very. A very Plutonian band. Get out of style. Mm-hmm. But so another thing that that in in astrological circles, like the uh, Pluto return, had been has been a big big thing, you know. And there seems to have been some you know deep disruptions and some overblown hype mm-hmm. that has led to death, um, you know. So it, it seems like there's still still something going yeah. on. Oh yeah, no. Again, we've we've got another 14 years before the energy finishes trickling away. And yeah, there was some real disruption. There was a lot of overblown hype. And the two are very tangled together. To say that it's fading does not mean that it's gone yet. It yeah. just means that it's going. So also archetypically, um, Uranus is also the planet of disruption, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah. did, did Pluto like steal disruption from Uranus? And is well, it they're, di- back, or? They're, different, they're different kinds of disruption. Think mm-hmm. about the difference between the American Revolution and the Russian Revolution. Wow. Okay, the American Revolution is the archetypal Uranian Revolution. We fight a war, we seize power, we create a radical new government, and based on ideals. Based, and we may flop miserably in fulfilling those ideals, but it, does, you know, it, it's actually striving toward an ideal of individual liberty, which is one of the basic principles of, of Uranus. The, right, the, right, the, right. The, the, the power of the individual. A Plutonian revolution like the Russian revolution was carried out by, by basically a secret clique. The Bolsheviks were not, you know, they, they basically stayed, waited until the Tsar's government was overthrown, um, subverted various stuff in the stage to coup and started murdering people. And of course, they had the Uranian throwaway lines saying, power to the people, meaning us. <laughs> but as soon as they got into power, they had the gulags, they had the mass graves, they held the whole nine yards. It was this, this very bizarre Plutonian destructive orgy. And so it's a different kind of disruption. Um, the American Revolution was not a revolution from below. I mean, it had, there were a lot of ordinary Americans but, who took part in it, but it was also the leadership came from, from the, um, the, the wealthy, the, the influential, the intellectual leadership of the colonies. Yeah, and so it was not. It, it's a different kind of disruption. Now, one of the things we can expect as as Pluto winds down is more Uranian revolutions, also more Neptunian revolutions. Neptune mm. is the revolution that doesn't really accomplish much. Like the Neptune is so 
Yeah, the hippie, the hippies were a profoundly Neptunian phenomenon. So was their equivalent in Europe um, 120 years earlier. America is about 120 years behind the time, behind the European mm-hmm. times. 18, 1848 was the big year. That was their 1968. Um, were there, so yeah, people, people yeah. like youths going off into the countryside and like. Oh yeah! Oh around. my God! Yes, that, that was that was going on. That was going on from the 1840s onwards. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, the thing is, the hippies, the hippies were not, the hippies did nothing original. The hippies were totally unoriginal. They were following European mode. And that also is a very Neptunian thing, just sort of drifting along. <clears throat> and um, lots of drugs, of course. There, there's this great scene, I cited in my book on Pluto, um, from, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of the Thomas Mann novels, Buttonbrooks. Oh, okay. It's it's about the rise and fall of a of a of a wealthy German family in in 18th century Germany, and there's this one scene where one of the members is is the head of the head of the government of one of these little German countries because Germany was divided, of course, into lots of little countries in those days. And in the revolution of 1848, the mob comes up to the the the, the city hall of the city state, and they're saying, "We want a republic." And the 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 Buttonbrook guy is saying, "You idiot! You've already got one." And the guy in, in the head of the mob looks nonplussed. Well, then we want another one. <laughs> That's a Neptunian revolution. Yeah. Um, Monty Python is, an, is Neptunian humor. Yeah. You know, there is no cannibalism in the British Navy. Uh, they're totally Neptunian. Um, <laughs> so so th- this also brings me to, like, in your book, at the end, you talk about um, the Tree of Life, the Kabbalist Kab- 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 mm-hmm. Tree of Life, and you have Neptune as Keter. Um, and Keter- Neptune as Keter. The one, yeah. you know, and it's like mm-hmm. merging with the one and that, that sense of exactly. very Neptunian. Yeah. But there's yeah. also the, from like a, a non-dual perspective, like you don't do anything. You don't exist. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, and, kind of, and that's what Neptune is because Neptune represents Keter, because Neptune is, is the, fund, the profound unity. Trying to deal with that energy in a practical sense down here on Earth is a mess. <laughs> it's a real mess. And most people, unless they become mystics, and of course mysticism is ruled by Neptune, unless they become mystics and simply dissolve into the cosmic womb, uh, they generally make a mess of it. Hmm. Um, so another thing that... that uh, you know, kind of, kind of coming back to a previous theme mm-hmm. of planetary rulerships. Um, mm-hmm. So, so we, we uh, looking at the Hellenistic model, like you have the Thema Mundi, you know, where you have Cancer mm-hmm. and Leo uh, ruled by the Sun and the Moon, and then flanking out from them the various other planets. So it's a very like orderly way of mm-hmm. assigning the um, the the rulerships, mm-hmm. and then based on like the aspects that's where how you assign like uh the exaltation and the fall and 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 Mm -hmm. um but with the modern rulerships that doesn't really happen um so well it does it does it does in a sense it does in a sense the distinction here is that the the division is between the rocky inner planets and the and the gas giants on the outside Ah, and the three rocky inner planets mercury venus mars each have two and the gas giants each have one, and they're in a nice smooth arc over the top. Yeah. So, so it actually works in a sense. This is another of the things that's going to have to be sorted out through about another 500 years of, of astrological and magical research and practice. Doubtless some scheme will be worked out that will make a brilliant sense, and then somebody will discover something else and throw it all off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, like that, That like... Uh model of the earth as the center and then the the, the oh, yeah and then the, pri- the the prime pr- prime mover at the you know on the yeah. outside oh yeah no there 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 are the, this goes on, this is a constant feature in in human science and it simply shows that human beings aren't as, we're not as smart as we like to think <laughs> and these brilliant models we come up with are creations of our minds they're not out there in the universe it's that there is right now evidence piling up for example of the big bang we all got taught about the big bang right there's evidence piling up that it didn't happen that the whole thing is <laughs> at, at just as as fictitious, just as it's a lovely, beautiful image like the Ptolemaic universe with Earth at the center. It just doesn't happen to be true. <laughs> and so there, in fact, three papers got 
banned from a, one of these, you can upload anything but not that, websites, are the, which is used for science, because they were challenging the big banks. So we're nearing crisis. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Get used to it. Um, human beings are not as bright as they like to think, and all of our theories are ultimately just stories. They're theories. The map is not the territory. Yeah, the map is not the territory, especially when the territory is the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but so so you've moved uh, Pluto. So Pluto doesn't, even though you use a modern rulership, you don't use Pluto as the ruler of uh, of Scorpio now. No, I, I would consider Pluto to be Pluto has some kind of relationship with Scorpio, and if I'm dealing with a situation, if a natal chart, for example, where Pluto is strongly placed, I would pay attention to its to its relationship to Scorpio and its, its anti-relationship, if you will, to Taurus. Uh. Um, in the same way, um, in my experience, Ceres and Virgo seem to have a connection. Uh-huh. And then what about like Chiron and Sagittarius? That's an interesting question. Um, possibly, yes. I'm very interested to see what astrologers work out with um, what's, what's the planet, Eris, which is the huh. other dwarf planet they found out there. Um, and exactly, you know, because it was just found uh, like maybe a decade ago. So there's a lot of work still to be done trying to figure out what are its correspondences. And since it moves so slowly, it's going to be a long time since we have before we have enough data. Yeah. Um, are there other dwarf planets? Probably yes. And just as just as there are astrologers who work with the asteroids and 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 produce useful information out of them, there will doubtless be astronomer or astrologers who work with um, the Kuiper Belt objects. Mm -hmm. and and extract useful information about them and that's again that's something that will take shape over the next 500 years or so right and, and like you know a lot of people work with fixed stars you know and those mm -hmm. different like they're just there are a lot, a lot of different things you can be working with yeah oh exactly no one human being can can actually master all of astrology it's simply too complex yeah there's too much of it um it, it is, I mean, really getting a grasp of natal, or natal astrology, that's beyond me. I'm working on mundane astrology, and I don't claim to have that down cold yet. Um, I, can do, I can do a really good ingress chart reading, but um, working with progress charts of, from foundation charts and things like that, that's still territory I'm working on. Um, I, I would love to see more people you know, break into some of these other branches of astrology. I'd like to see more work done with medical astrology. I'd like to see more yeah. work done with horror area astrology. I, I do horror area charts and I get really good results with them, but I know there's much more that can be learned from them. And so, yeah, there's all of these branches of astrology out there. It's a very complicated science. And we need more people who are willing to, to leave the beaten path and go find a specialty. Yeah. I'm, I'm super interested in medical astrology. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of really cool material. There's some some recent stuff and a lot of, of course, ancient medieval stuff that you can work with. And yeah, well, there are also some some good books from that time period you're talking about. I have a book uh, that Alan Leo published. Uh, he didn't write. Oh, it. yeah. And then mm -hmm. uh, Max Heindahl, a couple of Max Heindahl books about. Oh, yeah. Ma yeah. Max Heindahl was all over that stuff. He, um, Rosicrucians general. one of the things that the Rosicrucian tradition, and he was a Rosicrucian, of course, one of the things they're very into is, is healing. And he was a crackerjack astrologer. I have his astrology books. I use them. Hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, so have fun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I hope some of our listeners get into astrology more if they're just sort of mm -hmm. budding, budding an interest to it. There but, we go. Yeah. To, well, in particular, if you you've got it, this this is this is the plant coming podcast, as I recall. You've got uh, a lot of herbalists who listen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Culpepper, Nicholas Culpepper of Culpepper's Herbal. Oh yeah, an astrologer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> planetary mid, planetary connections for all his herbs. Yeah, Learn about them. There's so, all kinds of fun stuff there. For sure. <laughs> so in, in sort of wrapping up our, our time together, I'm curious what you predict the end of the Plutonian era will bring our society. Um, the first thing that it will bring, I think, and we're seeing this right now, is that a lot of overblown hype is beginning to crash to the ground. A lot of things that everyone knew with all these glorious future blood are, are, are crumbling around us. I think it's beginning to sink into most people that we're not going to the stars. 
it's beginning to sink in to most people that we're not going to have a nuclear powered you know utopian blah 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 robots doing all all human housework all this kind of stuff that it was fun science fiction but it's you know not going to happen um, so a lot of what's going to, a lot of, I think, what the end of the Plutonian era is going to see is a lot of people going, well, that was fun or maybe not. Now let's get back to, get back to business, get back to doing things w- with the world we've got. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of disappointment, a lot of shock. I think um, it's probable that um, just on a practical level, I expect uh, sometime by 20, right around 2036, nuclear disarmament treaties reducing where all the, the various nations all reduce their arsenals to very small levels. You'd, nobody in the world needs, you know, 5,000 nuclear warheads. You know, the, Chinese, the Chinese have like 250, and that's enough for them to d- deter everybody. <laughs> you know, who's going to risk that kind of thing? And so, yeah, 2036, after the various current great power rivalries are over, the nuclear powers get together and say, okay, everyone's going to have 100 bombs. That's enough. Yeah. And, and so um, by 2036, I expect the last of our fission reactors to be shut down forever. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's been a flop. It's been a white elephant. They but don't care on the bill. You know, we're just, just you know, another, another five years and we're going we're gonna to get that fission power. <laughs> If we do get fusion power, it's going to come from a completely unexpected direction. It's not going to be these vast tokamak machines that are sucking up so much um, money and so much talent and producing absolutely nothing. Um, my guess is that if we get a, if we get fusion, it's going to be somebody tinkering with the Farnsworth fuser or something like that who figures out some exotic way to make a modest amount of energy that way. Uh, and and it's not going to be utopia. It's not going to be um, apocalypse. It's just going to be oh wow. So here we have another. We have a way to make energy. It's a little more expensive than natural gas, but natural gas is is kind of rare. It's running out these days. But something like that. So do you think um, this will also kind of link with the general public's understanding that the you know general march towards progress is a myth, and we're I not. Think- you see, you see, I think, I think to some extent, the mythology of progress is a Plutonian phenomenon. Yeah. Because the idea of progress is that the past doesn't matter. We're tearing ourselves away from the past. We're going on to this glorious world of the future or this horrible world of the future. It doesn't matter as long as it's different from the world we live in. Right. And so it's, it's got that very Plutonian surging upward from the depths into infinite space. And I think it's quite possible that by 2036 or so, most people are going to realize that it was a crock, <laughs> that, that progress, I mean, yes, progress happens sometimes, so does regress. On, you know, we gradually pick up some new technological tricks over time, and then most of them end up not working for the long term. But the basic structure of human life does not change much. Mm-hmm. And... You know, there's there's this great illustration that I used in a, in a journal post a little while ago, where somebody took um, the the poster for the fall of the Roman Empire and grafted in um, Biden's face for Caesar and Pelosi's face for somebody else, and um, whoever it is that runs the Fed for a third one in a, in a Roman helmet, of course. It's hilarious, but it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you realize, looking at it, that things have not changed that much. Our clothing is different. But not much else. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, and so, I think it's entirely possible that you know, around twenty thirty six and thereafter, a lot of people are going to realize, okay, we that was interesting. Now let's get back to life. Uh, you, yeah, yeah. You describe in your book that um, the ancient Greek concept of cosmos is literally that which is beautifully ordered, and mm-hmm. Pluto is uh, defined as opposition to the cosmos. Yeah. So I'm super yeah. down to get back into that, which is beautifully ordered. It, it would be nice. I mean, we've had all of this, all of these, uh, this art and music and everything else that focused on wallowing in maximum ugliness. Oh. <laughs> because that's, re- that's liberating. That's, that's modern. That's cutting edge. That's, that's Pluto. Yeah. A brutal. I, for one... I'm desperately tired of it. I would like to see all of that stuff, you know, uh, stuck in a museum, you know, museum of failed ugliness somewhere. Anyone who wants to go there can go look at it. 
<laughs> and yeah. you know, I, th- I think I think it's it served whatever function it was there to serve. And now, can we please get back to um, creating a world that makes a little more sense? Thank you. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. <laughs>